Thank you. Um, uh, don't believe all of that. Uh, but um, uh, well, first of all, it's uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Um, you know, I did a tour of the university and tour of the school. What I will do is actually show you some of the things we're doing in two places. One is called Sensible City Lab. Uh, it's a research lab. It's at MIT. There are some thirty to forty people at MIT and from uh, uh, the Singapore. Uh, <coughs> Well, we do research uh, in architecture. Uh, we do something that's uh, quite connected to what uh, Dr. Fuller would have called anticipatory design science. We're trying to see how design can help us actually anticipate some of the conditions that we're going to see tomorrow. And in particular, we're looking at the intersection with the new technologies in the urban space. Then the other place is, uh, we'll see there is, is a design office called Carlo Ratti Sociati. We study in Italy, now we're in Italy, Italy and uh, the US. And that's where we do projects which are more related to uh, design and architecture, project building things, and all those things that you couldn't do in a research lab at the university. And then you know, I will show some projects. Another thing that we're doing, what well, you mentioned, the Copenhagen Wheel. Uh, uh, I have two presentations. I have main presentations, and then uh, I have also a presentation on Copenhagen Wheel. You can look at it uh, later if, uh, if you want. You know, I think it's nice to have a more interactive session and discussion and conversation. Um, and, and so there's a few startups that came out of the lab and, uh, and uh, became companies. The company we is one of them. It's a company called Super Pedestrian, and now it's based in, uh, in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, in a garage there. And really wants aims to make <coughs> each of us a super pedestrian using digital information and things like the company we. Um, uh, some others, uh, one of the startups from the lab was uh, one of the latest acquisitions by Facebook. Um, and there's a number of other things. So some of these ideas that are developed in the lab then become, become startups and become either company leader or smaller big companies. Um, I wanted to start with this, with this picture, um, because in the 1990s people really were excited about uh, the internet, the beginning of the net, uh, connectivity, and so on, so that they thought that our world would become increasingly virtual. Uh, 1990s, there was an essay called, a book called um, uh, The Death of Distance. Uh, you know, people were writing a lot about this, the fact that actually the internet would make physical distance less important. So much so that uh, some people even went to say that uh, cities would disappear. It is Gilder, 1995, he thought, you know, he, he wrote, cities are leftover baggage from the industrial era. And, you know, I think this poor guy who wrote it probably now has been regretting, regretting it since then um, because, you know, no prediction could have been more wrong. Um, we know the cities have been thriving over the past uh, few decades. There's a picture from China. China is planning to build more urban fabric than all of humanity ever built in this century. And uh, so, you know, if you, <clears throat> if you really want to do a lot of work as an, as an architect, as a planner, you know, China or a lot of Asia is the place to be now. And we also know that since 2008, half of the world's population now lives in cities. And um, this number might actually swell to 5 billion by 2030. So what has happened is that digital, all of the digital networks didn't kill physical space like uh, Gilder was, was thinking, but actually it's been a new, interesting hybrid condition in between digital and physical. Something like this is actually the logo we use for the lab, we use our business cards in the, in the lab at MIT. Something that's in between the digital layers and the physical space with us in the middle and with many, many interfaces we use every day in the middle. Let me give you an example of what is happening today in the urban scale and the scale of city and architecture taking a totally different discipline. A discipline, well, not a discipline, a totally different field. And, um, and that's actually Formula One racing. Now, if you take Formula One racing 10, 15 years ago, um, win a race to be a good car and a good driver. What was important was actually the physical infrastructure. Today, if you want to win a race, you still need a physical infrastructure, but you also need a digital one. You need a system like this one, which is a system of telemetry, that actually takes information, collects information in real time from thousands and thousands of sensors onto the car, sends the information to those computers where it's analyzed, it's processed, and decisions are made in real time. Well, in other terms, um, that's what an engineer would call a real-time control system. The system is made of two components, a sensing component, collecting information, and an activating component, responding to the information. And that picture I showed you before was really nothing than that. It's about you know, how we can actually use digital information in order to better understand what happens in our cities, to understand that if possible in real time, and then respond to that information. So that basically the whole city, every atom in the city, becomes almost like a sensing and activating. 
So um, that is, uh, you know, what in a certain sense, what is happening in Formula One is what is now happening in our cities, but also in our cars, in our buildings, many of the things, <coughs> in the many of the things we use in in the places we live, and the things we use in our everyday life. Now, you might ask, uh, all this is fine, but where is all of this leading us? And um, the interesting thing is that this is probably going to have profound consequences on the way we interface with the built environment. There was an exhibition at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, just a few years ago, two or three years ago, two years ago, I think. Uh, we were part of the exhibition, um, and the title was stopping. They did it actually because of this, because of what computer scientists would call ubiquitous computing, the fact that computing through networks, through sensors, and so on is getting everywhere. The ability we have, as I was saying before, to sense the condition of everything in our environment to respond to that information is as if our environment were starting to respond to us, to talk back to us. And you know, that's nothing else than an old dream of architecture. If you look at this, you know, this Michelangelo, when Michelangelo sculpted the mosaic, you see it there. Supposedly, he took a hammer and he threw the hammer to the nozzle. There's still a little chip on the knee. And, uh, and he shouted, Perché non parli? Why don't you speak? And today, for the first time, thanks to all this technology, actually our buildings, our cities, our objects can start, can start to speak back to us. And I think that's a fascinating thing for all of us who work in the field of design and planning and architecture. Having said that, what I did, uh, what we decided to do today is uh, I got, you know, I, I put together something like, something you could call like 10 points of interesting directions where we see that this convergence of digital and physical is actually opening new potential for, for all of us. And then, uh, you know, I want to open it for questions and then if you want, there were a few slides about Copenhagen Wheel. And that was mostly to actually show you how something went from the lab, from a pro research project, then into a prototype, and then into a startup, and then into but uh, let's start with the 10 points. And the first one, I would call something like public participation 2.0. Well, we're all familiar with, the, with images like this one, such as this one. And you know, that's uh, from the other spring. And the interesting thing there is that people from all the parts of the world actually use relatively new technologies, like Foursquare, just a few years old, or Twitter, or Facebook. They use all of that, in that case, to promote incredible political change. But, um, and then you can debate, you know, uh, is going in the right direction or not, but still, certainly, everybody would agree that that was an incredible change uh, at the level of all the country involved in this. Now, what if you could actually use the same things? Uh, not to uh, kick away a dictator, but actually to manage it in our everyday life. It is actually what uh, different people are doing. This is a picture from the New Urban Mechanics Initiative in Boston. Uh, we are involved things, uh, you know, how people could really become like urban mechanics, how people can actually report more and more information from the city, real-time information about what is wrong in the city, problems we need to fix, and how they can be more and more engaged, actually, in fixing them the first time. So that kind of new participation, if you think about it, cities, from the beginning, really were based on this kind of bottom-up movement of people coming together and doing something together. And then, over the past 100 years, 200 years, we lost a lot of those dynamics, we had to build a lot of cities in the 20th century, so cities became very big, so some of the participation was more difficult to manage, but perhaps actually some of the tools that allow us to connect with each other, some of the tools that we see online, can actually bring back the dimension of the city which was actually there from the beginning. It's the very essence of why we come together in cities. You know, when you think about it, cities didn't exist once upon a time. Uh, if you take human history, if you go back 50,000, 100,000 years to all of our ancestors, for most of the time, we didn't have cities. And then cities start at a certain point that when this kind of great invention of humanity, think about 7,000, 10,000 years ago, and really they, they emerge as something that can bring us together so that uh, the total becomes more than the sum of the parts. So you can live together, exchange ideas, you know, and, and uh, together accomplish more than we, what we could accomplish if we were just on our own. And so you know, this is really how we can use some of this in order to, to do that today in a different, on a different scale using digital technologies. There's other type of participation that you can look at and also you know, this kind of you know, similar dynamics you can look at. In this project, for instance, uh, we've been studying communities over space. Uh, that's uh, the UK. And we built the largest ever social network ever built. It's based on telecommunication 
decision maker. So you know, who's calling who in, uh, in the whole country? And then we started asking ourselves, can this tell us something more about the structure of local communities? You know, how would you redraw the geography of the country using not politics, not history, but really using the way we all connect with each other? And here's a quick video. I cannot, I cannot speak when, um, when the video is playing because the mic works either on the computer or on the video. So, but, um, I'll, so anyway, you saw how really we can actually use all this information in order to better understand what happens over space and how you can create this kind of geography, as I was saying, that's uh, really based on how we all naturally connect with each other. Another point I want to share with you is something you could, that really um, is related to some of the interfaces where we get a lot of this information. You know, interfaces like the smartphone. We can do plenty of things, you know, since many years now we can just, you know, look at the restaurant, look at the restaurant. You might have heard of Uber, it's actually changing mobility in many cities, was just acquired by Google recently. The fact that you can see all the taxis next to you, or the cars next to you, and you can actually book a car, a, a, a taxi, a big car uh, online, uh, with a simple app, and then, you know, that, that has interesting things because then also you can make uh, uh, the drivers more accountable, you can rate them, uh, you can simplify those things that we do every, every day in our life, but you, know, you can make them a bit simpler, and that has an advantage for all the citizens and uh, for the community, is it? Well, that's also what we're doing in Singapore. In Singapore, we're trying to collect real-time information from uh, all over the city, and um, then use this information and make it accessible to, to citizens. Uh, imagine a living city where you know in real time all what is happening there on yourself. And this is real time information from uh, the cell phone network, anonymized in Singapore. That's energy consumption and temperature. And you see when uh, it gets too hot, then also energy consumption increases because people turn off their conditioning. What happens during special events? What you see here is uh, Marina Bay. Here you see also the relationship they have with the weather. You know, when it rains, as you see, then it's very difficult to find one. How the city expands and shrinks during the day because of traffic. Your Singapore is, is a small island, but very, very densely populated, six million people there. And how all the local flows actually connect and intersect with the global one. So what you see here is all the containers getting to Singapore, all the people, all the flights getting to Singapore and going out to Singapore. So in how you can use all of that actually to, to develop new apps that can sum up similar to the ones we saw before. And so how can you use this to develop new apps, first of all? So apps that allow you to do different things. So there's actually, again, a few startups coming out of the project uh, for people who mix different type of information and we then give it to citizens. And how we can also show people. That's a picture from just a couple of weeks ago. 
um, at the museum in, uh, in the National Museum in Singapore, where we actually also took a lot of this data and made it publicly accessible to people that can browse and look at what's going on and basically discover your city in a different way and perhaps also use this information to change your behavior or propose new action. And that really leads to a city where, you know, there is this kind of uh, increasing flows of information if you want where everything talks, if you take the same name of the moment exhibition. Now, you know, it talks because uh, things respond to us, we can have <coughs> ideas, they have times, we can understand better what they're doing, um, or because we develop new systems of sensors. Now, in this case, for instance, we look at this computer here. If you look at this computer here, um, every chip inside the computer, you know, where it was produced, you see it on the map, how it moved on the planet, and how it became this machine. However, a few years from now, when you stop using this computer, you know very little about it. Sometimes uh, all the electronics actually is shipped illegally from the United States to Asia or from <coughs> Europe to, to Africa. So our idea was, could we actually design a little tag, put this tag on trash, and follow trash and see where it goes. It's a little bit like when you go to hospital, they put a tracer in your blood, and they follow your blood from your body. How could you do the same thing, actually, at the scale of, a, of an entire city? So we couldn't find anything off the shelf, so actually we had to engineer the little tag. It's almost like a miniature cell phone. Uh, we've been working with Qualcomm, a big chip producer in the United States, actually probably the biggest mobile chips uh, producer. And then we did the first deployment in Seattle, where we put those little tags on different pieces of trash. Yeah, we thought that the Fireworks Symphony was, was the music video. Um, so, what can you do with this? Um, you know, the first thing you can do is actually get a lot of information, then you are an engineer, a designer, you get all this information, you can design a more efficient system. Think about how much energy you could actually save using this information if you were to redesign the chain. The chain is very similar to the supply chain, but you could call it the removal chain, so it tells you know, how things move after you throw them. And the other thing that's quite interesting is um, um, that if you take this information and share this information with people, then you can promote interesting behavioral change dynamics. So, you know, today we know a lot of things about what's around ourselves. Um, data, this kind of big data component, is more and more important. If you take all the data we produce as humanity from the beginning to 2003, well, the same amount of data we produce now, we have 24 to 48 hours. And uh, you know, in the first in the first one you put together everything. So you put together everything from uh, Shakespeare to the Britannic, the Encyclopedia Britannica to uh, everything you, you you can think of. And then what we produce every 24 to 48 hours is certainly not the same quality, but the sheer quantity is the same. And then you know, if they take all of this data and then this data is shared with us, then that can help us make better decisions about what we do, about how we live. Um, somebody came to us at the end of the project and said, uh, you know, I used to drink water in plastic bottles every day and then um, throw the bottles away and forget about them. And now after the project, after I saw what happens to them, they go a few months from home and they will stay to a landfill and they will stay there forever, so I stopped drinking water in, in plastic bottles. There's a third thing we discovered with the project that was more unexpected, and that actually happened um, one day when a burglar came to our lab at MIT 
install a lot of things, including several tags in the computers that tell you where they go. And this is what happened.
All right. Um, you know, all of this we went from pollution. A lot of pollution actually is caused by mobility, but mobility is probably going to change a lot over the next few years. Uh, it's going to change a lot because we can actually sense our cities in an incredible way thanks to cell phone and mobile devices. So they can tell us actually how people move in real time, what people do in the city, which is the main reason why we move in cities, for doing things in the city. Uh, you know, we can sense that this is an old project we did. This was actually back in 2007, one of the first projects we did. What you see here is actually information in Amsterdam. We are opening a new lab in Amsterdam. This was an, an analysis we, we did on the city. And looking at text messaging at the end of the year, when people text each other and say, Happy New Year, uh, you know, it tells you in real time uh, what happens in the city, the activities that happen in the city. And you see the cycles, the daily cycles. You see that in the 2nd of January, 3rd of January. Uh, using all this information collected from, from the cell phone app. But you can use other type of information, like this is a um, beautiful map by Pedro Cruz, who was in our lab uh, <clears throat> a couple of years ago. This map was also at MoMA in New York. Uh, it actually looks at data from uh, billion and billion data points from the tax network in Lisbon and tells you how actually you can map it and visualize in order to understand the traffic situation in Lisbon. And once you have all this data, then you can do incredible things by analyzing it. So for instance, what you see here is New York City. We are working there to look at uh, uh, the taxi system. What you see, every dot is actually a pickup or a drop-off. So the color, uh, the blue or the yellow dot, will tell you it's a pickup or a drop-off. What you see here, by the way, is LaGuardia Airport. And then you can ask yourself, like, what if people could actually share a taxi? You know, it was difficult to do it like 10 years ago because you didn't know other people next to you actually wanted to share it. But that is very easy with this kind of location-based <coughs> services where you can see people around yourself who want to do any possible type of things. Uh, and you can also get a system where you can see who's going in the same direction and wants to get a taxi the same way. So it is very simple. Now, all of this is part of a bigger category of kind of project that use real-time information in order to understand how the city could, be, could, could actually work better, in this case, in terms of traffic and mobility. Um, in a certain sense, you could argue that tomorrow's problems, mobility problems, will not be solved that much with more asphalt, but maybe with more silicon, actually with more digital infrastructure. But then another big change is happening today, and that change is happening inside cars. So our cars as well, are becoming more intelligent, full of, full with, filled with sensors and, uh, and many other different uh, ways of collecting information. In the next project, for instance, what we're doing, we're working with uh, Audi Volkswagen to look at a car instrumented in order to better understand the frustration of the driver. It was the most stressful drive I've ever been on. Nevertheless, I think we have a lot of great content. 
to measure road frustration because I'm certainly frustrated at this point. Well, what you find out actually is quite exciting is the fact that you could run a city like Singapore or New York with basically 20% of the cars we have today on the road. So you can basically can run the city, take everybody to destination exactly what they want, and take away four cars out of five. So that radically changes. If you think about the impact of the car on the city in the 20th century, how all of our cities have been designed because of the car and because of mobility, especially over the past 50 or 100 years, then you know you see how this will radically change the paradigm as we as we look forward. You can also think about the other thing, the city itself might change. Think about crossings where you don't need traffic lights anymore. Actually where because of the intelligence systems of cars will just magically intersect without bumping into each other. Something like this. Don't try it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, all of this about uh, you know autonomy and intelligence in, in mobility also applies to something to other things beyond beyond the car. So uh, you know in the next project we did something. The next project was just a few months ago. You know on the MIT campus there's a, there's a problem. The MIT campus is uh, is very messy. There's uh, plenty of buildings. Every building has a different number. It is very it's very easy to lose orientation. 
And so we decided to use autonomy, in this case not with vehicles but with drones, in order to help people move around the campus. And in particular, people who often get lost, that's Harvard students. Here is the <laughs> Um, this is a you know, research project, but we're also going to do, do an installation that will be at the Venice Biennale. 
And Venice Biennale this year is run by a Dutch architect uh, called Frank Kulas. And uh, he invited a few people to, uh, to do installations there as part of his main installation. And this is part of uh, a, a room that looks at heat and how heat has evolved from something at the beginning, you know, when we moved into a proto thousands of years ago, it was humans trying to do for heat, and you could actually light a fire and then be together there, to actually this all of what has happened through uh, Victorian pipes and the decentralization of heat to the idea that tomorrow we could actually have heat following us instead of us following heat using the past. And that really is about how spaces, our spaces can become more responsive. And this is perhaps, a, you know, this is perhaps the, the, the part that looks a bit more <clears throat> in architecture uh, as uh, a lot of us think about it. Well, we like to think that all what we saw so far is also part of architecture. And architecture ultimately is about designing the interface between us and the environment out there. And this interface is now changing because of the ability we have, as we said before, to exchange information in a dynamic way, you know, to sense and actuate between, between the two sides. And so we, we would think that uh, all of what we saw so far is, uh, is part of architecture. But if you really want to see something that's more made of brick and mortars, here are some of the projects we are doing both at, uh, uh, at the lab and uh, in the office. This is a project we're doing with the city of Florence. Uh, Quest is to design new bus stops for the city. They need to change all of the bus stops. And the idea here um, was, you know, can you actually use this as a way to sense information from the city and give information back to people? Even something quite simple. You can do this with your iPhone. You know, you can see how to go to one position. But it's much easier if you have it at the bus stop, just put your finger on it, and then it will tell you how to go there in the easiest way. You don't need, even need to take out your, your iPhone from there. Uh, and think about you know, how difficult it is in a city like London today, where there are so many bus lines that you can understand. When you want to go somewhere to understand what's the best way to do it, and this becomes like a seamless interface. And then there's the interface you can have on a bus pole, like this one. Um, <clears throat> all of this is e ink, so it's um, <clears throat> the same technology you have on your Kindle. The difference between e ink and uh, an LCD is that an LCD needs to have light behind, so you use a lot of energy. Well, e ink uses very little energy, it's like uh, electronic paper, um, and it just reflects the natural light from the sun. And uh, so <clears throat> this will tell you real time information about the system. You know, if you need to, this is Italy, so if you need to run or if you need to walk or you know, go and have a coffee, an espresso. And, uh, and the same applies to the bus stop. Uh, itself and uh, the, the, whole, the whole shelter. Another example um, is, uh, it was mentioned before, so I thought I would include it, is this project that we did at the World Expo in uh, Saragossa. Uh, the World Expo in Saragossa was just before Shanghai, it was now four and a half years ago, and the theme of the expo was water. So the mayor came to us and uh, with a very precise question, you know, water has been a beautiful ingredient of architecture and planning for thousands of years. Think about how we've been using water in cities all across the world, not only for fountains, but think about cities in southern Europe, in North Africa. You know, beautiful ingredient of planning with agriculture. And his question was, how do we use today water in a different way because of digital technology? So this project started, started actually with MIT. We had a class with uh, a workshop with uh, Bill Mitchell and this Frenchman and other people. And uh, one idea was, you know, imagine you have a pipe. And on this pipe, you have many tabs, opening and closing control by a computer. Then you can create like a little water. So you can control water by the pixel. It's almost like printing water, like an inkjet printer made of water. Printing water, and then, you know, you can, uh, the water, you can show images or text or patterns on the water. If you approach the wall, actually, you can open up to let you, let you jump. So the mayor liked the idea, and we got the commission to design the building in the entrance of the expo, called the uh, Digital Water Pavilion. So there is no doors or windows, but when you approach it, it opens up to let you in. When you're inside, all of the spaces expand and shrink based on how many people you have. The roof is also covered with a thin layer of water. Next class is a, is a bridge by Zach Hadid <coughs> in the entrance as well. If there's too much wind, you can actually lower the roof to minimize splashing. 
And at the end of the day, you can actually close the building and uh, the whole architecture disappears. Hopefully without anybody else. <laughs> we, we have sensors for that. So um, here you can see, here you can see somebody before the opening. Uh, this guy was actually just moving, going to the station. You see he has a trolley, but stop there to try to understand what the hell is happening here. <laughs> Um, this was actually the building, uh, the water wall with projections on it. So you got pixels made of water and pixels, pixels made of light. And this was myself trying not to get wet, uh, and, you know, testing the sensors that open and close the, the water wall. Now, I usually say that, um, well, well, I should tell you now, what happened one night when all of the sensors stopped working. And, you know, the building is almost like a computer. Uh, it has uh, thousands of sensors detecting people. So the sensor, the ways when you approach a building, they open the water curtain so you can get in. And one of the computer crashes, crashed. Um, probably it was landing windows. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so then that night we were terrified. We didn't know what to do. Well, that night, however, was one of the most fun nights ever. That night we had thousands and thousands of kids from all of Zaragoza came to the pavilion to play a new game. Not anymore a pavilion that opens up to let you in, but a pavilion that you need to engage like this. And for us it was important because you know, as architects, engineers, we always think that we know how people will use the things we design, but then reality, and especially human reality, is always a big surprise. There's many other projects in this space of, if you want, architecture at the, at the edge of bits and atoms, physical and digital. You can find it on our website, you can find it on, the, on both the, the website, our office website and our uh, lab website. This is a project we did by an invitation by the mayor of London. Um, who wanted to actually create like what he described as a Eiffel Tower for the city. And our idea was to do something very light, uh, where people could go with a physical symbol, but a digital symbol as well with, uh, with uh, uh, light and images during the night, in a new type of experience for, for Londoners. This was actually selected to, um, to be built, but then um, uh, in the end, uh, because of lack of time and uh, changing politics, we, it wasn't finally, finally realized, but at one point it should have been um, built uh, uh, in London. And, uh, uh, well, starting to wrap up, and as I said, you can see many other projects more related to design and architecture in a traditional sense on our website. But personally, we all believe that actually all that showed before as well, all of that, those projects using information in order to change the interface between us and the outside world really are the very essence of architecture. Architecture is, the media, is mediating between us and the built environment. Um, and you know, just to start to wrap up, um, a lot of this is also changing a lot we study and a lot of way we do research. We used to think of knowledge as something like this, where everything could be in the right spot. Um, that's not the case. This idea is an idea that you know, was very popular in the Middle Ages when St. Thomas worked in Summa. Uh, if we had to think about the map of knowledge today, perhaps it might look a bit more like this. Um, this is actually a map that was on the cover of uh, Nature magazine. Uh, it, it was done by actually using 800,000 papers and looking at all the links between them. And what you see is this beautiful you know, net web emerging that goes from brain research to math to computer science to social sciences to mental health, where something where everything is connected with everything else. And a bit like in the internet. And then, you know, uh, again in Nature, there was an article looking at the top articles published in the past and today. You can see how important an article is in the scientific journal by looking at citations. How many people will cite it? It's a little bit like the likes on Facebook. How many people will like it? How many people will cite the same idea? And if you look at the most popular articles, the most, the most people use the measure of impact, the most impactful articles in the past, usually there were one author from one very well-defined discipline. However, today, actually, the most important articles are the ones from many authors from many disciplines. And that's really a big change, and that's really the way we work every day at the lab, trying to have people from different disciplines come together and collaborate. And that's also what we think is going to have a big impact on universities. 
we have seen the impact that the digital has had in many other fields. We've seen the impact that digital had, say, on Newsweek, like a great publication just disappeared from the physical world. And you know, in the education is not that different. We're actually transmitting knowledge in a different way. Yes, but you know, so that's why there's a lot of excitement about MITX or edX and many other ways to experiment with the ability to have classes that can actually reach out digitally to many more people than the ones you can have just on campus. And even fabrication and production is probably going to change. Um, you know, we see this cover less than a year ago in The Economist magazine. The Economist usually, the British magazine, is usually uh, quite soft-spoken. But actually, the third industrial revolution is quite a bold title. And what is it about? Well, it is about uh, these type of things. Machines that allow us now to fabricate things uh, on the spot. 3D printer, like, printers like this one. Now, um, I don't think this revolution will be as fast as we imagined because today we are still not able to take an iPhone, get all the drawings and 3D print it. We're not able to do this in the basement here. You can probably 3D print a good chunk of this, but then you still need to assemble. And that's why an iPhone is still assembled uh, in Taiwan and in China, and then you know you still need a big assembly plant. But uh, the changes, however, have been incredible. Now, 10 years ago, 3D printers at MIT, some of the most advanced ones, were actually making models made of powder. You might be familiar with them. They're quite cool. They're useful to study geometry, to study some complex geometry, but they're basically useless. You, know, you cannot do anything with them. But since this year, since last year, actually, G generally we started to use 3D printers to produce jet engines. The jet engines of the planes you're actually then flying. And that change has been spectacular, that everybody thinks it will change about the way we produce, and then the way we live, because that will have an impact on the cities. And, you know, if you don't need to have a big company, a big, big factory anymore to produce things, if you can produce things with a 3D printer in your basement, then how are we going to organize your city? Um, we're working on that, we're doing a master plan at the moment for Barcelona, for a new neighborhood in Barcelona, actually, all days of this, and thinking about how could it be, how could that develop in a way that would take into account this fact of production going back into the city. Um, that's about digital fabrication, not only uh, 3D printing, but every other type of digital fabrication. You know, that's what we do, that's a company, and we started like this, just digitally fabricating uh, a wheel, 3D printing a wheel, and then became the startup, and if you want later in the discussion, but a few some slides let me show you. And it, it happens in many other fields. This is a project we did that uh, presented at the Milan Design Week uh, just this year. And uh, Basically, um, one, of the Italian, uh, one of the main Italian furniture producers, called Cassina, uh, wanted to have a new collection that would actually start from this question. How is furniture going to change because of the way our life is changing? You know, a few years ago, you would actually go home, go on your sofa, and read the New York Times. Now you go home, you're on your sofa, and you don't have any printed newspaper. You actually have an iPad, and you will read the newspaper on the iPad, or you will do reply to email, you will reply to emails, or you will do other things online. And so the question was, you know, how is that going to change uh, uh, the furniture themselves? So he asked Philip Starr, a French designer, to a sofa, and he asked us to do a number of objects uh, in the home as well, including this uh, um, uh, coffee table. If we wanted to be to be both a traditional coffee table or a coffee table that could allow you actually to play with your iPad or computer, or even not have a party and uh, and you know enjoy time with friends. Now, this is okay, but um, how do you do that? And they say, you know, they, they like the idea, but they say, how can we do a system that will allow you to do this? And so, you probably couldn't do this a few years ago, but if you start thinking about what you can do today, the good thing about digital fabrication is that you can do one piece and repeat it all the same, or change it, change every piece, make it different from the other, the cost will be the same. It's the same difference, you know, when Gutenberg printed the Bible, he had to print every Bible the same. But now with a laser printer, we actually can print every Bible, every piece of paper different at the same price. So here, if you develop pieces like this and you do each of them slightly different in a parametric way, then you can create actually a system that is stable under different configurations. It's a kind of implicit program. It's like a chain that has different types of sta stable configurations. Like this, like this, or like this. And you know, that was initial idea, so we test, tried it out, and actually it was working. That's uh, 
piece of the coffee table looks terrible, but it's made of plastic. We just laser cut it and assembled it to see if it was working. And it was actually working as a, as a principle. And then, so we started testing it. Um, you know, then we started going to the final materials, aluminum and wood. Uh, this is the machine, just it's a laser cutter like the ones you have here, uh, just a big, big industrial one. And all the different pieces, how you assemble them, and you get them to the last one, this was the final one, produced, uh, open, uh, still a prototype, there's a better version actually that was done after this one, uh, but this was in, uh, uh, exhibited in Milan um, in, uh, in, uh, actually during, during the fair. Here's a quick video. And uh, all, of this, uh, all of these changes uh, are going to affect production, but they're also going to affect the way we interface with the uh, machine. So this kind of third industrial revolution is going to have an impact not only on the objects we produce, but also on how we interface with, uh, with the very chain of production. In this case, <clears throat> earlier this year, um, Google invited us to do a project in San Francisco. There's a uh, <clears throat> a party that uh, did, well, there's a big event in San Francisco called Google I.O. where all of the Google developers actually uh, spend a few days and uh, share information and, uh, and you know, work together. There's the biggest event organized by them. And at Google I.O. there's also a big party in the evening. So they came to us and said, you know, can we do a project there? And we really wanted to talk about do a project related to uh, what we said, the third industrial revolution. And so we wanted to share this this idea, and also look at uh, something that's becoming very popular in design and architecture schools all over the world, which are those kind of robotic arms that like to do things, to produce things. They are part of this kind of digital fabrication I was saying before. You can either use a 3D printer, you can use a laser cutter, you can use a router, you can use robotic arms, you know, they are part of the same family of digital system to digitally fabricate things. So you design something and then a machine will produce it for you. But you know, <clears throat> we wanted to show this by really put people at the center. In the heart of the revolution are the people. So we wanted to, people to engage and take control, to participate in the fun, and to come together and make new connections. Now, if you look at this change, it's doing something interesting, uh, the, the digital change. And if you're interested from a more theoretical point of view, you can go back to a lot of the work that was done in the 50s and 60s and 70s, for instance, by a group called the Situationists, the writing by Constant. Uh, you know, Constant thought about this idea, this, this idea of what he called homo ludens, uh, of somebody, you know, a man freed from labor because of a totally automated environment, who then will concentrate much more on design. So you think of this change, the consequence of that is that design is much more important, and each of us can actually put more power in thinking into design. <clears throat> then making is made by machines, so you don't need to care too much about the production because it will be a robot or a 3D printer or some, something producing the object. But then you can focus again on, on the result of that, you know, and we share that with other people. Something you would call, you can focus on two parts of the chain, on social creation and social consumption. So how you, we can come together to design things, and how much we can enjoy things for the day. So this is what we wanted to show, and then still we, we were at a loss about what we, what we could do. And so we said, well, you know, in the end, this is a party in San Francisco. There's plenty of people. There's going to be a concert. This year it was Billy Idol was there singing. And we were next to this. So the question was, you know, what, uh, what should we do? We said, well, you know, in the end, what about using this, using this very chain, design, make and enjoy, in one of the most fun things that people do when they go to the party, which is have a drink together. So we decided, what about if you could design your drink on your phone, mix the ingredients, and then the machines will produce it, the robots will produce it without a slice of lemon, without the mint, to make a mojito, shake it, and so on. Then you will get it. You will see all the ingredients, and then you will share it with your friends. You can make a new recipe. You have this kind of social creation and consumption. So it was more as a kind of an analogy, you know, to use something frivolous, but actually to show a very important concept, which is how we go from the design to the making to the enjoyment of the thing. 
Uh, here you can see the. Oops. Here you can see the machine being built. Uh, before Google, we actually exhibited it in, uh, in the design meeting with Anna as well. It's called Maker Shaper. And in the next video, actually, you can see then uh, you can see a little clip and you find many online uh, of the machine in use in, uh, in San Francisco. <laughs> and um, so you know, as I say, it was it was very successful at the party. Uh, actually, so much so that all the people were actually coming to the machine, not going to to be idle. And to, the concert. At one point, he actually took off his shirt in order to to, to get more people go go to the, the main stage. Uh, but uh, but uh, as I say, you know, this is uh, something that we did all for based on an invitation to do something for for a party. But if you look at that behind the kind of the frivolous side of it, behind you know, the making a drink, there is actually something quite profound. That is a said, you know, from a theoretical point of view, goes back to this idea of how then design becomes more important. Could become more important tomorrow, not production, but the design side. And then what comes at the end of production, which is actually how we can share things and enjoy things together. So it's social creation and consumption. Well, um, I will finish with one point. I want to leave you with this point, which is uh, all this is also going to, to change radically our life, the way we live and work in our cities. If you look at this picture, uh, it is Corbusier. Corbusier, one of the greatest architects of the past century. In, the, in 1931, he and other people at CM actually presented what is called the Chardin. And uh, in the Chardin, Corbusier said basically, in order to improve human condition, we need to separate every human activity in cities. We do have a place for living, a place for, a place for sleeping, a place for working, a place for leisure, and then connection with and if you think about it, that's absurd. Because then if you think about it, you've got this, you build three different cities. A city for working, that would be empty during, sorry, a city for working, that would be empty during the night. A city for sleeping, that would be empty during the day. A city for leisure, and there's a lot of traffic between the different parts of the city. So it's no surprise that since the 50s and 60s and 70s, one of the main mantras in urban planning has been mixed use developments. It goes back to Jane Jacobs, it goes back to Lewis Mumford, it goes back to many other people at the time, of how can you actually create neighborhoods where you put a little bit of everything so they're much more balanced and they, don't, they are not this kind of uh, uh, big, what French would call cité d'ortoir, a city just for sleeping, which is totally dead during the day, or vice versa, a city for working, which is totally dead during the night. Um, and it is great, and that's how we've been designing cities over the past few decades. However, perhaps, something new is happening today. Perhaps some of these changes we've been seeing are going to produce a much, fine, much finer mix of uh, inside the city of the different activities. Something that could actually radically change the distinction between public and private transport, pu public and private space, and uh, that really the very, in the very structure of, of buildings. And let me tell you what I, what I mean by starting with, uh, with an example right, uh, and then an analysis. So what you see here is the MIT campus. Um, you know, the MIT campus is Boston from the satellite. It's actually quite a green city, but here, you know, there's a post-nuclear explosion. It's, it's, a, it's a winter picture. Um, um, that's the River Charles. It's MIT. It's like a little city inside the city. Uh, you know, Harvard, don't bother. Out there. <laughs> and uh, uh, since early 2000, actually, MIT was one of the first campuses in the United States to be fully covered by Wi-Fi. It was one of the things that Dean Mitchell, the Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning, really promoted. So it's probably the first one to be fully covered by Wi-Fi. And it has been producing incredible change in the way people work. So what you see to the left is like a computer room, a traditional computer room pre-Wi-Fi, 
All you see to the right is actually what happens after. Now, don't translate too much, it's a bit extreme. You know, what I, what I, what I, the, the picture I picked to the left is the most appalling computer room I could find, you know, no natural, no daylight, uh, uh, you know, a terrible place. And what you see to the right is actually during the summer, yes, people can work like that, you can work outdoors, but uh, if you go to the campus now, when it's quite cold and full of snow, it's not like that. But you get the sense of the changes that have been happening. So changes go really from thinking about our places for working, like what you see at the top, to ways of working, which are more similar to what you see at the bottom. And that's quite nice, because if you think about it, if you had to choose, if you didn't know anything, if you just somebody a thousand years from now, looking at those two pictures, if we were asked, you know, where would you like to spend your life, you probably would say, you know, in a place at the bottom. So it seems to be a nice, interesting change for architecture and for people who design spaces. So our idea was, let's actually go and find out in more detail what is happening. And how do you find out? Well, a lot of these changes are really produced by the ability we have today to be more flexible. And that ability actually is recorded on the Wi-Fi network. So if you actually go and use the Wi-Fi network, which is the main reason these changes are happening, and if you monitor that information, you might be able to look at how things are changing on campus. So what you see here is all the Wi-Fi nodes. Almost every room has a Wi-Fi node. And then you can then use it how many people are connected and see how people move over the campus. People waking up in the morning, moving to another place, go to another place. So you see how activity changes between different parts of campus. Let me show you just, for instance, the total activity on campus, which is what you see here during a week uh, on the MIT campus. So um, here you see Monday, people get to work around 9 or 10 a.m. Uh, some people leave at 5, but not that many. Many people keep on working till very late at night, like 10 or 11 or so. Still in the middle of the night, you've got quite a bit of activity going on on the network. And the same pattern actually happens on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, not on Friday, because you see people activity slips away in the early afternoon on Friday. And then Saturday and Sunday are almost like normal days. You remove the 9 to 5 people, minority for the total population, it takes almost like two normal days in terms of activity. Uh, we said that you find almost every Sunday night, you find this uh, uh, little chip then here at the end between 9 and 10. And that's when all of us realize that tomorrow is Monday again. And that's when we go to the computer in order to do the things we, we haven't done. So, well, if you take all this and actually look at this for every room in the, in, in, uh, at MIT, you can see a number of them here, but you can actually do it for thousands of of access points, then it's interesting because you can see a signature for each of them. And that signature tells you how the space is being used. So it's a way to get almost like a thermography of the space. How many where people are there, you know, which part of the day. And then you analyze all the signatures, again mathematically, you can do things like Fourier transform and other ways of clustering. And the interesting thing, you can, you can look at the spaces that work in a similar way. Clusters of spaces that work in a similar way. What you find, you find a picture very similar to the one I showed you before at the beginning, just the second slide after the Corbusier, which is how everything is becoming much more mixed, how really technology is liberating us and allowing us to do things in a more flexible way. And so the use of your space is radically changing. Uh, we can now use the same space, for instance, as a cafe, as a meeting room, as a place for working, something we couldn't do just five or ten years ago when we were chained to our desk. In, in the office, we're working on a number of uh, projects of uh, city, urban, the urban scale. This is a new city, they call it, but it's basically the, the, a big massive plan in the center of Guadalajara. In this case, for instance, we're looking at this idea of the office in a place like Guadalajara where the weather is always beautiful, it's almost like spring. Can you actually think about the office going out, migrating outdoors? Of actually us being able to work outdoors as much as indoors um, because of the flexibility that we have today. Um, I will jump to the end of the, the video just to show you now. And basically we started reusing the courtiers, the great courtiers of the Mexican traditions as places really for, for as extension for the offices next door.
responsive urban fabric, effectively a living lab for digital technology platforms, fosters the growth of future media industries. Ciudad Creativa Digital, a unique investment opportunity to shape tomorrow's creative economy, an unparalleled development to serve Guadalajara, Mexico, Latin America, and the world. And uh, so I think there's something quite interesting in all of these developments because you know you saw all the technologies today, but in the end you know you shouldn't focus about technologies. And there's almost like a beautiful paradox about technology. You know, the paradox, if you want, of ubiquitous computing, is that when technology is everywhere, you can finally forget about it, and then technology becomes an enabler that allows us to do what we want to do. And those things are really always the same. And they're about better living conditions, better places where we can or leave or be done. And so I want to finish with this picture. That's a little project we did in, uh, in Milan, in the center of Milan. This is the uh, <clears throat> Scala Theater. This is the, the, the main square in Milan. Um, that's an extension to one of the fashion houses called Rosardi. And they wanted to do this extension that initially was supposed to be an extension to the cafe, but we said, can we actually use this as something uh, different based on these new ways of working and living? Could this, you know, this has a, a roof. The roof was done together with a botanist from, from Paris, a guy called Patrick Blanc, who invented the vertical, the vertical garden. Um, but in a way to create this kind of responsive cloud of uh, vertical elements that will filter the sign and change from one day to the next one, from one season to another one. But the idea is, can we actually do this more than just a cafe? Can this be a place where you can go there and actually make it your living room for a few hours? So you know, meet other people extension to your office, because they will laptop to be keep on working when they're there. It has become one of the most exciting places and successful places in, in the center of Milan since we built it just a few years ago. And I really want to finish with this again to say that, you know, forget about all the technologies I showed you today, but look at the human side. You know, all of this is about, not about uh, using new gadgets in cities, but it's about how this can change our life. And in some cases, it changes our lives by allowing us to go back to the old things that we all like you know, to how we build sociable cities and with better environmental conditions where we can all come together. Thank you. Forgetting something is actually important in life, in life, in society, in order to move forward. 
Um, now, um, I want to say a couple, just a couple of things. The first one is that if anybody, any of you is interested, there is actually an interesting short story by Italo Calvino. He's the writer who wrote Invisible Cities. And his little short story, short story is called The Memory of the War. And he wrote this, surprisingly enough, before the internet really started. Or, you know, yes, the internet started theoretically, but you know, it was not as fun. This was like in the late 60s. And he imagined a condition where everything on the planet can actually be recorded. And if you read it, it's quite interesting because that condition in the short story inevitably leads to mystery, murder, and, uh, tra and, tra and tragedy. Now, what you're doing today, actually, we're exactly creating that world. If you think about what Google, what everybody's been doing, is actually digitizing our physical world. So creating this world where everything is archived. Now, there's many solutions that this, uh, there's many ways that this can proceed forward. And I will not get into detail. You know, some people think that it's important that people who produce the data still have control on the data. Some people think that uh, it is important that actually everything is open. They could, you know, you could think about the word of total transparency. Some anthropologists went back to look at how we used to share information when we were hunter and gatherers and living in a grotto. At the time, there was no privacy, so we could also go back to work maybe with our privacy. But the question is not which is the right solution. But so I, I don't know what the right solution is. But one thing you know is that the way our society will be tomorrow depends on the choices we do today. And so that choice, that that issue, is an issue we should all debate and discuss. That's why at MIT we, we've been doing it a second time. This year we did a forum called Engaging Data. Uh, this year it was quite a fun discussion between uh, uh, Gary Gellman, uh, who actually leaked ex Snowden in the United uh, Revelations in the United States, and um, uh, Noam Chomsky, professor and activist, uh, about data. So I think it is, uh, we want to contribute to the discussion, and I think it's a discussion we should all take part in, because that will shape our society. Um, that's another great question. I think you know what you see with all of this. If you think about it, a design for thousands of years was something that was really not left in the hands of designers. Cities were really built with a big collaborative effort in a kind of bottom-up way. Uh, you know, in a, in a very natural way, engaging people. People themselves were the first designers of, of the building environment. And the things have changed a little bit in the 20th century. And then one of the questions is, you know, could some of these dynamics we saw today Dynamics that allow us to connect more on the social network actually change that and make participation more relevant to that. It's something quite interesting. If you look at one of the people who advocated, there's many people who advocated for participation in the past century. You can think about people like John Habrak, great guy. There's just a video, a video on him, a movie made of him, you find him on Vimeo. Um, uh, he's a Dutch architect, uh, he's now probably 80 or 80 something. And he really spent all his life looking at participation. And his idea was really that uh, there's a certain autonomy of the built environment, which goes much beyond what we can do as architects. You know, we need to start from that and think of the architect as somebody who can just help uh, start from that autonomy, and they're uh, modified, but not really think that it has full control of the system. So you can look at him, you can look at people like Christopher Alexander, who wrote a lot in this space, and, and many, many others in the, in the UK, you had the Smithsons. Uh, and a lot of the people from Team, team 10, who in the 60s and 70s did a lot of, uh, of experiments in this. And, but you've got something telling. If you, read, if you read some of the books by Christopher Alexander, uh, you know, he advocates for participation for, um, for the whole book. Think about the Oregon experiment, about how participation in making design in the campus of the United States. And then there's something quite telling. You, there's one passage. I think it's in that book, or in one of the other books, where he says, yeah, but you know, when you put more than 16 people in the room, then it becomes a mess. And so the fact that actually it's, it's difficult to engage in this participation, the dynamics of participation. However, today, thanks to the net, and we see it every day on Facebook or on some of the other networks, we can put in the same, around the same table, not a physical table, but a virtual table, not 16, but 1,600, 16,000 people actually talking about the city. So I think the great question we have today is, could some of these dynamics we've seen that are changing the way we connect with each other actually bring participation to a new level? 
It was a little bit what I started discussing in the first point, saying participation 2.0, but you can apply it to another level, much more to architecture. And the idea we have is that there's a book we, we, we just finished that's coming out next year uh, that's called Open Source Architecture. It's about can we actually use the same dynamics of open source, apply not to making software, but actually making buildings. And there we try to advance the idea of something you could call like a core architect. The core architect, which is you know, somebody we actually work together with, Others in order to, to get to the building or the city. Any other comments or questions? Yes. So, for instance, you know, in the example 